Father, we come before you, Lord. We thank you again for the opportunity to take in the Word of God. We pray, Father, that the believers here might continue to appropriate your Word by faith and grow in your grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the prophetic Word, which clearly reveals um, our Savior and glorification, Father, and his return to establish his kingdom upon the earth. We look forward to that time, Father. In the meantime, help us to continue to uh, be about the Father's business, fulfilling your plan in the church age until the rapture of the church. And sanctify the believers here through your truth, because your word is truth. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, last time we were dealing with the uh, contrast between the rapture and the second coming. And as you know, the rapture is an imminent event, uh, the very next event on the church age calendar. Uh, there are no other events that must take place before the coming of Christ for the church. Therefore, it could occur uh, today. It could occur tomorrow. Uh, there are no signs uh, that will have to be fulfilled before uh, the Lord Jesus Christ comes for the church. Uh, the rapture and the second coming are separated by at least seven years. After the rapture of the church, uh, the world will go through a time of turmoil. We call that the tribulation period. It's also named the day of the Lord, an unparalleled time of trouble and judgment. Uh, but even during that time, God will save uh, an innum innumerable multitude, as in Revelation chapter 7. Uh, but after that period of time, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ will come in a second coming. And this second coming will be in stark contrast to the coming for the church. He will come with power and great glory. Uh, therefore, he will come to the earth to establish his kingdom and every eye will see him, no one will miss his coming. So we went over some of these. Uh, we'll just run through the first few contrasts here uh, quickly, and then we'll uh, continue with those contrasts. Uh, the first contrast we studied last week is the translated saints go to heaven, uh, as in John 14, two and three. Christ said, in my father's house are many rooms or dwelling places. He's coming to take the believers back to be with him. Whereas in his second coming, he will translate saint, translated saints uh, will return to the earth. We will return with him from heaven to the earth in Revelation 19, 7, 8, 14, and 15. Rapture consists of the translation of all believers. Our bodies will be changed and we will be caught up to be with the Lord Whereas no translation is mentioned at all. There's no change in the body that's mentioned. Um, we'll have our glorified body in heaven and we'll return with that glorified body. So when you study all the second coming passages, it's the, the translation of the believer is silent. It's only applicable to Christ coming for the church. Christ comes for his own. He comes to take his own back to be with him in heaven. And that, that whereas second coming, Christ comes with his own. He comes with his bride. Uh, the bride is already married, and he returns with them in Revelation 19. Uh, at the rapture, uh, the earth is not judged at that point. Now, shortly afterwards, it will be judged Called uh, during that tribulation period. God will pour out a series of unparalleled judgments, sealed trumpet and bold judgments, 21 in number, and then, um, he, but his second coming, that judgment continues as not only the earth is judged, but he will return and judge the Antichrist and establish his righteous kingdom in Revelation 19, 15. The fifth contrast is this event of the rapture will occur before the day of the Lord wrath. Uh, we're not to point him to wrath that day the Lord wrath, but to obtain stage, fee, stage three salvation, which would be our glorification. Uh, and this is based on the finished work sacrifice of Christ, who died for us, whether he wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Whereas the second coming will conclude the day of wrath. It will follow after the day of wrath. And I would like to add another passage to this in Jeremiah 30, verse seven. 
Uh, he deals with the nation of Israel during that time. And he calls this period of time, that tribulation period, especially the last three and a half years, uh, the time of Jacob's trouble. So it's not the time of the church's trouble, it's the time of Jacob's trouble. That's also based on Daniel 70 at 7. It's for Daniel's people, that last seven year period. It's not for the church. Uh, the church was not revealed in the Old Testament. So we have to make a clear distinction between Israel and the church, even in light of eschatological events. Alas, for the day is great, so that none is like it. It is a time of Jacob's trouble. But notice here, he shall be saved out of it. Meaning that uh, God will preserve a remnant through that time of judgment. And they will be rescued by the Lord Jesus Christ at his second coming. Whereas the church is kept from the hour. Israel goes through the hour. Um, a similar contrast, by the way, in typology before the flood, before the worldwide flood in Genesis, we have Enoch who was taken to be with the Lord. He was translated in Hebrews 11. But uh, he, was, he was taken before the flood began and removed. Whereas Noah was kept safe through that period of time. And Noah's a type of the tribulation saints so that will be preserved through that period of time. So interesting typology, God has done this in the past. God take some away from the judgment and he allows others to go through, protected through the judgment. Next contrast, we have the rapture is imminent. Imminent. It could occur at any moment. It is a, therefore, because it's imminent, it's signless. If you had a sign that must occur, let's say, for instance, the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem, which I believe will occur, and, it, and you already have the implements in, in place for that to occur. But if we looked for the rebuilding the temple before we looked for Christ's return, then Christ's return would not be imminent. Understand that. Any event that must occur, very important word, must, any event that must occur before the coming of Christ will cause that coming not to be imminent. Very important. Now, that doesn't mean that there will not be events that could occur before the coming. But if we have to look for an event first uh, before the coming of Christ, then we'll, we won't be looking for Christ. And so that, that event is any moment, silence, no signs. As a matter of fact, James, use, James uses the language a judge is standing at the door. I believe he uses a perfect tense there. He stood at the door when he wrote James, Epistle of James, and the judge continues to stand at the door, meaning that he could occur, any, he could have come at any moment, and therefore the Bama seat judgment would occur shortly afterwards. Whereas definite signs, and that's what we have in Matthew 24, we've been looking at uh, precursors to that period of time, and various signs that will occur in the tribulation period, Matthew 24, verses 3 through 30, including the ultimate sign of the Shekinah glory of God that will occur right immediately before the second coming, the sign of the Son of Man in verse 30. We'll address that um, down the road. But you definitely have events that will occur before the second coming, such as false Christ in Matthew 24, 5, wars and rumors of wars, uh, nation rise against nation, disease, famine, earthquakes, um, unparalleled persecution, verse 9, false prophets, verse 11, the abomination of desolation, verse 15, and so forth. So there's definitely signs that will preclude the second coming, but not the rapture. Um, the rapture is not revealed in the Old Testament because the church age dispensation is a mystery. We can even call it the mystery dispensation. Uh, it was unforeseen in the Old Testament and therefore uh, it's not revealed. A mystery, a New Testament mystery, is something that was not revealed in the Old Testament but now is. That's the de biblical definition of a mystery. Uh, it was not mentioned in the Old Testament. Uh, even the uh, the the uh, event of the 
Rapture is a mystery uh, in the translation of the bodies of believers being caught up while being alive to something that was not revealed in the Old Testament. Whereas the second coming was. Second coming was predicted in Daniel 7, 13 and 14 and uh, probably another dozen passages in the Old Testament that uh, predicts the second coming, including Song chapter 2. Uh, that pictures certainly the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and that passage is predicted, it was predicted in Daniel 7 and in the New Testament, Revelation 19, 11, and 16. So that's an important contrast. Now, I remember Dr. Walvard, I took a class off of Dr. Walvard called The Rapture Question. We had to um, critique other rapture positions other than the pre-trib rapture. So I was assigned the pre-wrath rapture view, which was a popular view by Marvin Rosenthal, who used to head up Friends of Israel. Uh, and uh, his view has been critiqued by Arnold Frutenbaum and uh, certainly Rennie Showers, Reynolds Showers has refuted that position. But um, I had to write a paper with my friend against the pre-wrath rapture view. And uh, the pre-wrath rapture view, uh, I think, confuses the mystery nature of the church as all those are not views that are not pre-trib. Mystery nature of the church, um, and therefore that's why they mingle Israel's plan with the church's plan. But those two are the two distinct programs in the scripture. Now, the rapture involves believers only, believers only. And notice the dead in Christ. Now, that term used by the Apostle Paul is used of only believers in the church age. No other believer, whether Old Testament saint, tribulation saint, millennial saint, and there will be believers in the millennium and the tribulation, None of them are ever called or ever said, stated, nothing is sta uh, in the scripture that indicates that they are called being in Christ. Only the believers are in Christ in the church age. Why is that? What places us in Christ, by the way? What ministry of the Holy Spirit puts us in that position? We call that positional truth. The baptism ministry of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. By one spirit, are you all baptized into one body. And being in, in the body of Christ, we are positionally united to Christ, and therefore we're in Christ. And if I can argue that the baptism ministry of the Holy Spirit began on the day of Pentecost, which I think I can, John the Baptist predicted as something future, he will baptize you with the Spirit. That hasn't occurred in the Old Testament. <clears throat> in the book of Acts, Acts 1, it says, Not many days hence, Acts 1, 5. Uh, and then in Acts 10, I believe, it looks back to the event of Pentecost. So Pentecost was the first time where believers were incorporated into Christ. And therefore, that's a technical phrase uh, of individuals in the church age. So every person who is born again from the day of Pentecost till the coming of Christ for the church, the rapture, every single individual in that period of time, is in Christ. You're all in Christ. If you're born again here, everyone, if everyone here is born again, you are in Christ. You are in Christ. Now, that uh, then the coming of Christ for the church will be not only the catching up believers who are alive, but the resurrection of the dead in Christ. So it's very important. That resurrection is exclusively of church age believers, not Old Testament saints, in Christ dead in Christ, uh, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. Whereas the second coming affects all men. Uh, believers are only affected in the rapture. Second coming certainly is judgment on the unsaved. Now, a very important uh, point is during this dispensation, Satan is not bound. There's some people who have a hard time figuring it out, figuring that one out, but uh, the Bible clearly indicates that Satan is loose in 1 Peter 5, 18. He's like a roaring lion walking about, seeking whom he may devour. Um, 
he is active. Uh, he's not in state. He's not in hell. This mythology of Satan being uh, in hell. Uh, he's not in hell. Satan is not in hell. Satan is loose. He uh, is even in the book of Job. By the way, he appeared before God in heaven after the fall. In Job chapter two, uh, Satan is loose right now, but. One day he will be bound in the heart of the earth, uh, the abyss, Revelation 20, verse 2. And that will be during the kingdom, which points out the very important fact we're not in the kingdom. Why? Because Satan is not bound. Now, those who teach all millennial theology indicate that they believe that Satan is bound in a spiritual sense, but he's not bound. You can't take 1 Peter 5, 8, and Revelation 20, verse 2, side by side, and say that those two are the same thing. You know, it's not, it was, would be ridiculous to say that, well, maybe Satan's just on a long chain and the chain goes all the way around the world. Right? Or you can bind Satan in some sense. No, I don't think so. An angel from heaven will do that job, by the way. Revelation 20, verse 2. It's very important that we have an angel who has the chain, who lays hold of Satan, the dragon. You're not the one binding Satan. You're the one standing against Satan today with the spiritual armor in Ephesians 6. Now, the rapture occurs in the air, in the air. So the Lord will come from heaven with the shout, and the voice of the archangel and the dead in Christ will rise first, but he will come, first of all, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Verse 17, we will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord where? In the air. As one preacher put it, I'll see you there in the air. <laughs> uh, we will one day be caught up in the air, the atmosphere of the earth. He will come as far down to the clouds. He will not come down to the earth. He comes in the air, and calls believers up from there. That's where caught up, up to where? where he comes to. He comes down from heaven in the air, and then the believers are caught up to that point, and he takes them back to heaven. Whereas the second coming, he comes all the way to the earth. He comes all the way to the earth because we know that uh, we have these Gentile nations that stand before the Lord Jesus Christ on the earth. These are saved uh, and lost Gentile nations on the earth, and uh, he comes to sit on his throne, and the nations will be gathered together there. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. And there he speaks about inheriting the kingdom in verse 34, which at that point uh, is right at the doorstep. Now he comes for his bride uh, in John 14, verse 3. We are the bride of Christ. So he prepares a place for us and he comes to take his bride back to that place he has prepared. Whereas he comes with his bride, Revelation 19, 7. The bride comes with him to the earth. And by the way, the Bible says wherever the Lord is, we will always be with him. So once we're caught up, we're with him seven years in heaven while the God unleashes his wrath upon the world. We will return with him and we'll be with him in the kingdom, and then we will be with him in the eternal state. Uh, we will be always with him, never to be departed from his, the bride and bridegroom are inseparable at that point. At the coming of Christ uh, for the church, uh, only his own will see him. I think that is implied, certainly, when he comes to the air and he calls up believers and if that translation of our body occurs quickly as in the moment in the twinkling of an eye in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 and 52. I'll just read that text. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Now, the word moment is a Greek word for Adam. Now, the Greeks view the atom as the smallest indivisible unit. Now, we know scientifically that the atom was split and, 
even in further particles, neutrons, I was in high school, neutrons, protons, electrons, but now it's quarks and further <laughs> particles, subatomic atomic particles. But the word in the Greek, Adam, to their, to their culture then, meant the smallest indivisible unit. Now, when you apply that to time, that would be, we would translate in a atom of time, meaning very quickly, in essence, we would translate it. And then the twinkling of an eye, the time it takes light to reflect off your eyeball, uh, the time it takes that, 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 that refraction of light, uh, it doesn't take very long. So the terminology used of the speed of our change seems to me, seems to indicate that uh, only believers will see him when he comes. Uh, unbelievers, they'll miss, just will be gone in a moment. Just boom, change, boom, we'll be with him. Um, whereas the second coming, no one's going to miss it. Second coming, he, I think he ascends slowly because every eye will see him, Revelation 1-7. Now, as the earth rotates, I think, he will take at least 24 hours in his descent, I think implied. And as the earth rotates, darkness to light, he will come. And when everything is dark and he will come with brilliant glory, Revelation 1-7 says this, Behold, he's coming with clouds. And that cl those clouds, by the way, uh, not in the clouds here, but with clouds, it can include glorified saints and angels uh, and the Shekinah glory of God himself. So every eye will see him. Notice every eye will see him. No one on earth is going to miss the second coming. Uh, we could see easily how people will miss the coming uh, for the church. Obviously, the after effects, you know, like the movies Left Behind will be there. You're driving down the freeway and the Lord returns. <laughs> Car crashes, plane pilot gets raptured. You know, you see that scenario here. Certainly the effects of believers missing <laughs> will be here. Although the lie, again, the public lie of why believers are missing. Maybe aliens finally got rid of those uh, evil Christians or whatever. <laughs> I don't know what kind of excuse they're going to formulate when the believers are raptured, but they'll come up with some concoction, plausible excuse to try to explain why millions of believers are not here. But the second coming, they're going to see the Son of Man return. He's going to make sure that everyone sees this. And uh, what a fearful sight that will be for the lost Tribulation begins uh, after the rapture of the church, day of the Lord's judgment. Uh, we're not of the night nor of the darkness, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 through 4. We don't belong to that period of time. Whereas the millennial kingdom begins after the second coming. So very important, tribulation begins after the rapture, whereas millennial kingdom begins after the second coming. As a matter of fact, Matthew 24, 27 says, For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. What does lightning flashing from east to west convey? Visibility. Visibility. Uh, and, and the idea is not something hidden, uh, something that is observable to the eye to all. And I think that's the illustration there. Um, then the Son of Man will be like that. This is his second coming. Now, we're going to look at some New Testament passages uh, in light of the second coming. And we're going to make some observations of what occurs in association with the second coming. Very important. When you start listing various things that are occurring associated with the second coming, you'll clearly see that this is not the rapture. We've already made those contrasts in that in the chart form, but we're going to see these verses here that describe the second coming um, in the, these passages. Let's take a look at um, beginning Matthew 16. Matthew 16, verse 27. 
For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels. Very important. So he's going to come with angels. Um, the only angel that's mentioned, by the way, uh, in the rapture of the church is the arch an archangel. Right? Singular. In uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. Here he comes with angels. He comes with angels. Uh, he will come in his glory. Uh, and then he will reward each one according to his works. And then he bases, the, he gives that introduction before the Mount of Transfiguration incident. Verse 26, As surely I say to you, there shall there is some standing here who will not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And then he is transfigured before him in verse 2, uh, it's chapter 17. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as the light. Imagine that. Brilliant Shekinah glory shining through the sun. And uh, we have that event, which was a preview of the second coming. And it's a preview of second coming of Christ in his kingdom. So people have taken that verse that, uh, well, the kingdom is now because he's telling his disciples that, they're not going to die before they see the kingdom come. So they assume that that means he's going to implement his kingdom during their lifetime. No, he's going to give a preview of his second coming in their lifetime, which is exactly what he did in the Mount of Transfiguration. So that was one of the passages that Kingdom Now theologians try to use to say that, well, they're going to, in their lifetime, the kingdom's going to come. Uh, well, what happened in their lifetime was a preview of that second coming kingdom. As a matter of fact, we see uh, Peter elaborate. We'll just jump over to 2 Peter 1.16. That's one of our passages, 2 Peter 1.16. Peter mentions this, uh, comments on this event, by the way, what happened there in the Mount of Transfiguration. We do not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty, his brilliant glory. Think about that. We saw him. Who was on the mount with him? Well, Peter. Peter was on that mount. So Peter's writing this, where we were a witness to what this preview of the second coming. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. We heard this voice when, which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And that's the Mount of Transfiguration. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed. Notice that. That was a confirmation of the various prophecies in the Old Testament that those will be fulfilled in a literal fashion. So the prophecies of the Son of Man's glorification and coming, this uh, event uh, reinforced that, but yet the Word of God is more firm than even their experience. He says, which you do, do heed, uh, do well to heed uh, as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the morning star rises in your hearts knowing this, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, meaning what God revealed in the Old Testament was given to certain individuals to record in the Word of God. I think this is not interpretation, but inspiration. It's not talking about how you, know, you can't interpret the Word of God. It's talking about originally when it was given, it wasn't made up by any individual. Uh, God revealed it through His Holy Spirit. Uh, no prophecy came by the, for, in verse 21, explains what he means by that. No prophecy is any private interpretation. Just read the following verse. Verse 20, prophecy never came by the will of man, meaning man's own initiative, meaning the prophetic word that was written and revealed in the Old Testament, did not come simply by some heightened enlightenment of individuals, but it was revealed. But holy men of God, spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. We have a word for uh, the wind blowing the sails uh, in the Greek. 
they were born along, carried along to their appropriate destination of inerrancy. Um, they were directed to record this prophetic truth of Christ's second coming. So Peter says we had that confirmed when we saw Christ in the Mount of Transfiguration, the prophecies about his coming. This is a confirmation that it will occur. It will happen as was revealed in the Word of God. Now, um, of course, our passage that we're closely approaching in Matthew 25, verse 31. Um, well, that's in the following chapter here, but I'm talking about Matthew 24. It's, it's interesting, Matthew 24, um, first of all, verse 30. Uh, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And then, verse 31 of chapter 25, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him. So it's a very important marker there as you're studying the passage. It's almost like he reveals these events beginning with... Um, you know, the early events of the tribulation following the, the abomination, desolation, 2415, and second coming. And then he gives a series of parables and illustrations, and then he picks up where he left off with the chronology in Matthew 25, 31. So that's the way, the way we should look at the text there. All right, let's take a look at uh, Luke 21. Oh, wait, before we do that, uh, one, one, observate, one point of observation in Matthew 25, verse 31. He comes in brilliant glory. Several points here. He comes with all the holy angels. See that? All the holy angels. Not just an archangel. He comes with all the holy angels. And then he's going to sit on the throne of his glory, meaning his kingdom will be brought to bear. His kingdom will be brought to bear. And then he will judge Gentile nations on how they treated the Jews during the tribulation. Sheep and goat nations. That judgment of the sheep and goats is not the judgment of believers. It's not the great white throne judgment either. That will occur over a thousand years later. This is a separate judgment. Um, but this will only occur when Christ returns to the earth to establish his kingdom. Now, Luke 21, 27 and 28. Praetorists, as we've stated before, try to view these events as being in the past, already fulfilled. Uh, they try to compare the second coming in a non-literal way uh, to God's coming and judgment on the Jews with the temple destruction. Now, the temple was destroyed, as revealed in Daniel, but that wasn't the end of these things. Um, there's still a future second coming of Christ. That, that coming, by the way, was not the second coming. Um, but there's still a future second coming of Christ in which Israel will be redeemed. Let's take a look at Luke 21, 27 and 28. All right. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your head because you're through. <laughs> it's over. It's too late. I'm going to make sure that the church replaces Israel. Let's take a look at the text. When you see these things, look up, lift up your head because your redemption draws near. Wow. So it does show you that there'll be uh, national salvation for Israel at the second coming of Christ. Very important. This holds out hope for the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Instead of Judgment ending in AD 70, the church has replaced Israel. There's redemption at the second coming. Hope for Israel. And that's very important. Uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 26. 
This passage also confirms a future nationally for the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, we hear a lot about anti-Semitism, and of course anti-Semitism is evil. Uh, and even a policy of why we should support the Jews today, uh, I think, because they are God's chosen people. That doesn't mean that they are born again. They still, many of them are enemies of the cross of Christ, as Paul stated. They still need salvation by grace through faith, but God's hand is upon the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Going all the way back to the Abrahamic covenant promise in Genesis 12, I will bless them that bless you, and I will curse them that curse you. Meaning nations that oppose the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will be opposed. And we can trace this through history, by the way. Nations that turn their back on the Jews in history, those nations have been judged and begins with the Spanish Inquisition. And uh, Britain, at one point, persecuted the Jews. And all the other nations, they're second rate. They are not like they were before in strength and power. Spain and Britain and other, France and other nations that uh, had a anti-Semitic, course, obviously Germany with Adolf Hitler, um, they were judged. All the nations in the past that have turned against the Jews uh, and, be and became anti-Semitic have been judged. You can study that. By the way, there's an excellent book tracing his the history of anti-Semitism, uh, and it's by Hal Lindsley, The Road to Holocaust. And I think that's even better than his book, The Late Great Planet Earth. I think, I think he actually it was more well-written then the late great planet Earth, uh, Hal Lindsley's The Road to Holocaust. And he traces a history of nations that have turned their back on the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we should be, uh, you know, why be pro-Israel? You hear a lot about this in politics today because the Bible's pro-Israel. That's why we take it, we, we believe it because it's biblically, a biblical stance. Uh, now, uh, let's take a look at uh, Romans chapter, and by the way, Satan hates the Jews. Just keep that in mind, too. Uh, Romans eleven twenty six. Romans eleven twenty six. 26. Um, he talks about blindness in part having to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles have come in. And then verse 26, so all Israel be saved. When? It's when the deliverer will come out of Jerusalem. The deliverer will come out of Jerusalem, Zion. He will turn away ungodliness from Jacob when he cleanses them of their sins, which presupposes their faith in the Messiah. First of all, the new covenant blessings will occur, as in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 30, um, 31. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now, Verse 28 gives us the current condition of the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. There are many Jews that oppose Jesus as the Messiah and attack Christians. But keep in mind concerning the election, meaning national election, not individual election. Very important. We have an interesting point here that when the word elect here is used, he's not talking about individuals because obviously they're enemies of the gospel. They're unsaved. Understand that. So I can't talk about individuals going to heaven here when the word election is used. He's talking about God's choice of the, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as a people group, as a nation. Concerning the election national election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers, meaning the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the Abrahamic covenant. So even though they're opposed to the gospel, they are beloved and they're chosen. How about that? Uh, when I think uh, some uh, one ministry um, to the Jews is called Chosen People Ministries. There's various ministries ministering to, uh, giving the gospel out to 
uh, Jews, uh, but it's appropriate, taken from the Word of God here, chosen people. They are God's choice. It doesn't mean they're born again. God's favor was upon the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as a people group. Um, we sing America the Beautiful, and the one line of the America the Beautiful is uh, God's favor uh, rest upon thee, or something to that effect. We, we're saying that we want God's blessing as a whole, as a country, to fall upon us. And um, God's blessing has been upon this country. Doesn't mean everyone's a Christian, everyone's born again. But we have to acknowledge that God's blessing has been. But it's as we turn our back on the Jews, then that blessings start to slip. And as the remnant uh, shrinks, people are, who are not positive to the teaching of God's word and are anti-Semitic, um, then the, the uh, judgment increases on, upon our country. Now take a look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote uh, about the coming of Christ for the church. He also wrote about the second coming as well. So uh, he mentions both in his epistles. Um, he said this, So that he may establish your heart blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Notice, with all his saints. Not for his saints, but with all his saints. I believe that would be in reference to the second coming. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, <clears throat> he says, uh, And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And judgment, notice here, flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and uh, who do not obey the gospel of of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is obeying the gospel, by the way? What's well, the command? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> and if you don't believe, you're disobedient. There's not salvation by works that's being taught here. We have several times in the New Testament talking about the obedience of faith. Uh, faith itself is simply believing God's word, taking it at uh, taking God at His word. It is an act of obedience. It's not a work. It's not a work at all. Simply um, positive volition to the gospel message. So here we have in this passage, and um, it's going back to Second uh, Thessalonians 2, uh, verse 8, and flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and do, those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because their testimony among you was believed. So he's going to punish his enemies at his second coming, especially when the sword comes out of his mouth and uh, he attacks the Antichrist and defeats the armies in opposition to him. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. He speaks about the lawless one who is the Antichrist, who will be revealed when the Lord will whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brilliance of his coming. And that's the second coming. He's going to wait till the end of the tribulation to come as he returns on a white horse and the sword comes out of his mouth at the campaign, the last phase of the campaign of Armageddon, and he will speak the word of God. I think the sword imagery would be a picture that he speaks the word of God and he's going to thoroughly defeat his enemies. And he's going to tread the wine press of the wrath of God alone. He won't need our help, even though there's armies of angels and saints, millions, returning with him out of heaven. All he has to do is speak the word of God to defeat the enemies of Satan. Uh, he's going to destroy them with the breath of his mouth and his brilliant coming. Imagine that. 
Now, let's take a look at 2 Peter 1.16, continuing passages on the second coming in the New Testament. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. And let's take a look here. We read this passage earlier, but uh, we'll look at it again. We did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And Jude, verse 14. Jude, verse 14 and 15. And Jude refers to Enoch, who predicted the second coming. It's interesting. Um, Enoch, the first person, I think, that understood clearly through Revelation about Christ's second coming was his prophet Enoch, the seventh from Adam. It's interesting, by the way, when you look at the age of the earth, uh, he literally lists him as seventh. From Adam, so those genealogies are there unbroken, in the sense, um, no gaps there, uh, at least. Now we do know from Matthew and Luke there may be when he says son of there may be grand grandfather, but there's not. I don't think there's big gaps in the genealogy of Christ that you can fit millions of years. You know, uh, it would be ridiculous saying that my you know, great great grandfather lived, you know, ten million years ago. I mean <laughs> I mean, it's just absurd. It's it's absurd. You know, some people try to um force that into the text. But um he's the seventh from Adam, and notice verse fourteen, he prophesied about these men, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his Holy ones. The word saints there can be translated holy ones. Now that can, I think, include both redeemed believers or holy, uh, and, and as church age believers will be glorified, and angels. Or the word holy ones can be angels as well. So I think both are true. He'll return with how many? Ten thousands. I mean, not just ten thousand, ten thousands. <laughs> Multiply ten thousands by ten thousands. And myriads of angels. Myriads of angels and redeemed men. Great multitude, we could say. He gonna, he's going to return with a great entourage of saints and believers in his second coming. And he's going to execute judgment, a common theme that we see associated with the second coming. Notice verse 15. To execute judgment on all. To convict all who are ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. I think we have the word ungodly mentioned five times in that passage. So he's coming to judge. He's coming to judge uh, in his second coming. And then Revelation 1 7, which we read earlier, we'll read again. Um, Behold, he's coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Now, what's added here is, who pierced him? Well, the Jews as a people group in his first coming. And the Jews will witness as a people group, obviously, uh, his second coming. And then he speaks about the Gentiles. I think he speaks here two separate groups of people, Jews and Gentiles, basically. Those who pierced him will see a second coming, the Jews. And then we have the Gentiles as well. All the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. And I believe this is a mourning, not in repentance. This is a mourning in uh, dread and fear. A dreadful fear as he returns in his second coming. And then Revelation chapter 19 Revelation 19, and this is probably the, other than Matthew 24, I think this is probably the main passage that elaborates extensively on the second coming, the imagery here. Revelation 19, verse 11. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. 
and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Notice he is the ultimate warrior. <laughs> and uh, you ever hear the expression, there's no, there's, uh, no good war. There's no, no war that's good. Um, and the Bible indicates the Lord Jesus Christ. There are, there are there righteous conflicts, yes. Are there conflicts worth fighting for? And just think if our forefathers decided not to combat, um, including my dad, by the way, who fought in World War II, Adolf Hitler. What if we decided as a country not to oppose him? We'd probably all speak in German today. <laughs> uh, he had, uh, 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 he was trying to take over literally the world at that point, and six million Jews were slaughtered. So to stand up against that is just. Absolutely, absolutely. So you have the peaceniks who don't like to hear that, but uh, you know, there are righteous wars, including the Lord Jesus Christ who will return in the second coming. His eyes were like a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. And you hear we sing the hymn, crown and with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. Uh, we have multiple crowns, which includes the diadem crown, which is his kingly rule. He doesn't use the word Stephanos. Earlier in Revelation 2 and 3, when speaking of believers' crowns, two, different, two, two separate Greek words. The Stephanos crown is for the born-again believer. The diadem crown is for Christ as ruler, King of kings and Lord of lords. He's coming to rule the nations of the earth. So we have the diadem. We sing the hymn, bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. So he returns with the di diadem crowns. And uh, keep in mind, we're not talking about, I say, wow, he's, you know, Polly's 50 crowns on his head. Uh, no, it's not talking about a medieval crown. We think of a kingly crown, medieval crown. Uh, they had literally uh, uh, turbans in that day, Middle Eastern, uh, and they have ribbons. And he probably has one that represents each nation that he will rule over wrapped around his head, it probably in that in that sense. He comes with many diadem crowns as he returns to defeat his enemies. Um, notice here, uh, he had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. Now we know that in uh, Isaiah 63, he comes with blood-stained garments. He's gonna tread the winepress of the wrath of Almighty God. And his name is called the Word of God. Who's that? Well, John wrote the Gospel of John. He introduces Jesus Christ as the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The deity of Christ is highlighted there. The armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, dress whites. That includes us, by the way, church-age believers. White and clean, followed him on white horses. So we follow him. Not only does he return, on a white stallion, but we follow him. Uh, and then out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, probably here, figurative language, but uh, the idea of the spoken word of God, defeating his enemies, that with it he should strike the nations, nations that have defied him during that period of time, during the tribulation. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. Now, when you trace that, phrase throughout the Bible, especially the book of Revelation, and then this phrase is taken out of, of Song 2. He will rule with authority the nations. So it's a picture of his millennial rule. He's going to rule the nations with great authority. So Song chapter 2 is alluded there. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. You remember earlier when he poured out the sealed judgments in Revelation 5, we had the wrath of the Lamb. So we have the wrath of Almighty God poured out upon his enemies. He had on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He'll be ruler over all other rulers. He'll be Lord over all other lords, earthly rulers. When he rules the nations of this planet. Think about it. He'll have authority over every single nation upon the earth. And the Antichrist will, he will be judge and Christ will reign 
forever, not just simply three and a half years. And then we have a great feast. Uh, we have those invited to a supper. And we verse 12, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, cry with a loud voice, saying, To all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come, gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and captains, mighty men, horses, those who sit on him, both um, you know, the flesh of all people, free and slave, small and great. I saw the beasts, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Psalm chapter 2 again. Why do the heathens rage and the people imagine a vain thing, trying to defeat the king of kings and lord of lords? They'll be satanically motivated. Then that beast, the Antichrist, was captured with him the false prophet, his sidekick, who worked signs and miracles in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped the image, his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Probably the first two occupants of hell. The lake of fire is Gehenna hell. The rest were killed with the sword, with the proceeds out of the mouth of him who sits on the horse. And the birds were filled with their flesh at a great supper. Which, by the way, in our passage, in verse 28, wherever the carcass is, there will the eagles, better vultures, will be gathered together. The birds of prey, we could say, where, that, where the carcass is. So it does show you, by the way, Matthew understood that judgment is associated with the second coming. And it parallels perfectly what we see at the end of Revelation 19. Same imagery here. Let's stop right there. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the second coming of Christ. And, and we thank you that um, your son will be revealed in power and great glory. We look forward to that second coming, the establishment of your kingdom. And Father, just motivate us, Lord, to continue to share the gospel as we await the, first of all, the imminent return of Christ for the church, knowing that you are not appointing us, you have not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. So we look forward to that day when Christ will return for his own. And then finally, with his own, to establish his righteous kingdom. Continue to help us to have hope uh, in uh, Jesus' name, amen.